Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, who, uh, about data today. Who, who, who writes SQL? Yay. OK, because if, if you don't write SQL, my talk's going to go way over your head. Um, um, and I'm going to, first, I'm going to talk about um, some miscon. First, I'm going to talk about why, why I, I'm capable of talking about this problem. And then, and then we're going to talk about some misconceptions you have about data. That, that if you use SQL, uh, it, it'll be something that you probably think you know. But anyway, I think it'll, I, so when I'm talking about the SQL stuff, it will seem really simple, but pay attention. So the first thing I'm going to talk to do is tell a joke. OK, when I was uh, a kid, my stepmother was always mad at me for doing a sloppy job about things. And so, th so she told me this joke. And um, there's a, a, a busker who's playing violin. And, um, and uh, he's, he's playing a concerto, and, um, or, or playing something. And an, an, a little Italian old man comes up next to him and listens to him very intently. And then when he finishes the song, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Italian man goes, encore, encore. And so the guy plays it again. And then after he's done, the little Italian man goes, encore, encore. And so he does it one more time. And when he stops this time, he says, I, I know you're appreciating my music, but why do you keep saying encore? And the, little, the man says, you're going to do it again and again and again until you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been building the same thing over and over again for a bazillion years, OK? Uh, I just got asked, how did you get to Looker? How did you get to Malloy? Well, in, in 1987, I wrote my first database programming language called Force. It was the native code compiler that, you know, and two of us wrote it in assembly language for two million lines of code. And then I built DBase, and I was an architect on DBase, and I built the first application server for the web that was hooking up a web server and a database and a programming language. And then I did a bunch of startups where I built tooling. I was the CTO of these companies, and the very first thing that I would do when I would come in was that I would build an interface to data so that normal people in the company could start looking at data. So I built it at a, at a company that was one of the first uh, gig economy companies called LiveOps. And then I built it at, a, uh, at an ad tech company. And then I built it at a staffing company. And then eventually I said, you know, I'm going to start a company because I keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we built Looker. OK. And um, so we learned a lot building Looker. Now, when, when, when one of the great things about starting a company and, being, and listening to your customers and building something new is that people make you smarter. And so as we were building Looker, I, get to, I would go sit with CTOs, and they would tell me, you know, it would be better if you did this, and it would be better if you did that. And have you thought about looking at it this way? And, and we learned a lot while building Looker. And so Malloy is the next, the next thing. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, which is this language that we're building to deal with data, where we're taking all the stuff that we learned over the years and trying to build something new. And it's, a, it's, a, it's experimental. It's still a work in progress. But I think you'll, you'll, you'll be excited to see it. And the first thing that we realized while building, actually, we've been building Looker, we discovered this, but data is not rectangular, right? When you're dealing with data that's at all complex, it's not in a table, right? Humans, humans think in rectangles. If you're, looking, if you're using Excel, if you're using um, SQL, you know, the, the, the operations that you do on, on data is always against a rectangle. Um, so whether it's you start by filtering the you have a, a, a rectangle, you filter the rows. The standard thing that you do is you group by something and you ag aggregate. You, um, you can project, which is you can take a, a table and you can add another column, which is basically Excel's way of doing things. Um, or window functions, which are kind of like a mix between the two of those things. Right? But those are the operations that we do against rectangles. And in SQL, what we do is we do a join, which we take a table, we bunch of tables, we join them together, and then we do these operations, right? And, um, and that changes how we think about data. That is, that is the fundamental way that we operate on data. This is why the way we build data warehouses is, is because of this, in, in this form. And what I'm saying is it's a misconception, which is really a weird thing to say. Right? And I'm going to show you why that's a misconception. Um, so we, I'm going to, a simple orders table. We, we have four orders made by, uh, what, three different users, right, on, on a couple of different days. Really simple data set. And 
they bought, each of them bought some different things. They bought candy, because that's what I like, candy. So, so uh, user, one, uh, user one bought uh, a chocolate and, wait, so where are we? Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the first order contained uh, uh, chocolate and Twizzlers. And what, what we end up doing here is uh, we want to compute the two things from this. So we want to compute uh, the total amount of revenue and we want to figure out the total shipping cost. These are the two things we want to compute, right? And so how would we go about doing this? Well, to compute shipping is pretty simple. You just take the table, add a sum on it, right? No problem, right? And to compute the revenue, it's pretty simple. We just sum this column, right? That's how we would do it. Um, um, and, and if we want to do it by date, we can add a dimension in it, and we can look at the, the shipping by date, or we can look at the... Um, uh, the revenue by date. It's, again, relatively simple computation. But, um, but then you want to ask the question, how does shipping relate to revenue? So you want a table that looks like this. And you would think that you could do this, right? How many people have used this as an interview question? Right? <laughs> right? This is a, you know, what's wrong with this query? The wrong, what's wrong with the query is that the shipping is wrong because it's overstated. And why is the shipping overstated? Because uh, for order one, there are two items, and so we double count shipping for item one. And for order uh, two, we double count shipping for item two. And for order four, we double count the shipping, right? So, so we have to do a different technique in order if we're using SQL to do this, right? Or generally, this is the general Generally, what you end up doing is something different than this. And what you do is you combine rectangles. You produce a rectangle that looks like this. And then you produce another rectangle that looks like that. And then you combine them together with a query that looks like this. So this is kind of how you would write this query, right? Anybody would write it differently than that? Pretty much, pretty much what you would do with it, right? Um, and this is kind of how we work with data. But it, does it have to be this way? Um, uh, if we want to take order date and we want to look at it by user instead, we have to take this query, right? And we have to go through and replace every place that we have order date with user ID, right? And we get our results. And so there's a lot of, so when you have SQL, you end up copying and pasting a lot. You end up, you end up, you end up building up these queries with, with templates, right? You, you, there, there's a lot of ways of trying to solve this problem but mostly, but mostly it's the problem is that we can't operate on the rec, we can't, we're operating on a rectangle when the graph's in a network. Is that making sense? So this is the basis of traditional data warehousing. This is why when we do ETL, we have so many fact tables, right? Because we produce, our unit of reusability is a, a table that looks like some dimensionality and some calculation, and you produce a whole bunch of these things, and then you kind of join them together in, in a way that makes sense to you. So you're always, whatever, you're always producing the, the your, your reusability is actually data, not, not definition. Your reusability is not the, the, the calculation for, for, for total um, shipping, but the fact table that is that thing that you join together. And so, um, so this is kind of the whole Inman thing, the whole, the whole traditional data warehousing way of doing things. Um, but it was designed at a time when databases were slow. Um, and, 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 and it has another problem, which is that if you're going to produce an, an intermediate artifact, it's not real time, right? So you're going to produce this thing and then join it up again later. So Malloy, enter Malloy. Malloy solves this problem. How does, so, so how does Malloy solve this problem, right? <laughs> this is like the old VC pitch. You set up a problem and then you show a solution. So now I'm going to show you the solution. <laughs> um, Malloy makes the problem, promise that join relations don't affect calculations. So if you define a calculation against a rectangle and another calculation against another rectangle, and you do the computation about them in the same query, they won't affect each other no matter how the join pattern works. How does that? Um, so you first describe, so join patterns are really important. You first describe the network because that's all the data that you might want to talk about. And the second thing that you do is you write the query against it but when you write that query, it guarantees computational correctness relative to the rectangle that you're dealing with. Um, and we call that network a source. So you're going to hear me talk about data sources. 
Um, and a source is basically a network of, of, of tables that are joined and some, also some calculations that are associated with it. Um, and so the, the, the locality of the computation is the locality of the rectangle that you're, that you're dealing with. So let's take a look at a simple Malloy query. So the first part of this is the source. In this, and, and Malloy queries are actually much simpler than this. But I'm, uh, but I'm writing one without a, basically the, the, the most literal query I can write that's equivalent to SQL. I'm taking two tables, one orders and order items, and I'm joining them together on order ID. Right? Um, the second thing I'm doing is I'm doing a, a calculation for total revenue. Now, I notice that I have to say items.price.sum because the, the calculation for this sum is relative to the items table. To, so, I, so I have to know which, where I'm doing the calculation in the network. So items.price tells me where, and then the sum operator operates on that, on that number. And because I'm, I'm summing that number, I know where in the network to operate on it. And then total shipping, um, that sum. And the result is my answer, right? Um, so that just makes things a lot easier especially if I just want to look at different dimensionality. So I always talk about exploring data as kind of like x-raying, right? You come at it at one angle or a CT scan. You come in it from one angle. You come at it from another angle. And so the ability to have the ability to move and try different, you know, you can pick any dimension in the network, in this whole network, and you can change it, and this query is going to work and give you accurate results. And so that gives you this freedom to, think, to not have to think about the problem, reformulate your queries. It really simplifies the way that you work with data. So this is so we call it dimensional freedom. Does that make sense? So this is what that query looks like. Um, you could write it. Um, it's kind of uh, basically what it does is it aggregates the thing that's repeated based on a distinct key. You don't have to understand this, okay? But but if you want to understand it, what it does is it collects. Uh, it figures out a primary key for the thing that's repeated, and then dedupes it, and then does the sum against that for you. Um, so Malloy's reusability is the source. So in that query that I just did, I can actually write a source that looks like this. And what this is doing is it's saying, here's the network of joins. Here are the calculations I might want to make in this network, right? And then querying becomes really simple, right? Because I just have that source. It's all predefined. And I can actually write these queries that just do the right thing. And so what you end up doing is you write this. So we talk about reusability. You write the source once, and then all, you have lots of little queries that do different things that are all very readable. Does that make sense? Pause. Any questions? I, I'm moving fast, so I have time. Yeah? No? Great. Um, it also turns out that data comes naturally nested. So Parquet format or JSON or, you know, or, you know, or, or Spanner, all of this, these data tables have data that is naturally nested. Okay, so normally in, in SQL, you have all, of the all the tables are separate, and then you join them. But in the real world, you have things like JSON objects. And if I were looking at an orders table, there exists no order items without an order, right? You can't really have an order item that's not part of an order. So, in this case, we, we might have a JSON table that expressed the, the orders just like we were seeing it, right? So you have an order, and then you have a, an array of items that is, nested within, that is nested within the order, right? That's just the way it is. You, don't really, you really wouldn't, it, having to separate them is kind of an artifact of the SQL engine, not really of the real world, right? Because it's, it's kind of the way you would want it. And Malloy knows how to deal with this automatically. So if you load a Parquet file with nested data, then Malloy knows how to deal with it and can just do the thing automatically for you. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So it's really cool because you can just take something that's a protobuf, like an output of, or you know, just basically the output of your logs, and you can just start querying them directly with Malloy, right? Just straight out of the box. Yeah, so it joins in Malloy are there two, I'm sorry, the, the question was, what's, what's the deal with join one and join many? What do you, what's that? 
Okay, so in jo jo joints are pretty simplified. In, jo in Malloy, there are three types of joints. There's a cross joint, a join cross, a join many, and a join one. And a join one says, I am an order item and I have one order. Or I'm an order and I have one user. And if I'm in um, orders, I have many items. So join many would be, I, I, I have one order has many items. So you have to indicate which that is so that the calculations can, can work correctly. But, but that's the thing that, it's the only thing that you need to define to make sure the calculations are correct. Um, so we talked about how Malloy reads nested data, but Malloy also writes nested data. So in every dialect of SQL that's kind of mature, there, is, uh, uh, there are arrays, and there are structs, and there are uh, uh, array ag, and, you know, and all of those things are really because are weird, are, are, are really just nested queries, okay? And so, in, in, so this works by doing an array ag, but what it does is it allows any query that you have in Malloy that is a top-level query can be nested. So that by items query is a legitimate query that could be at the top level or at any level, and you can nest any query within any other query in Malloy to produce nested results. And so what we're seeing here is that we have our order items, our order date, and we have our revenue by date, and then we see the items that we sold on that date. Right? And that's a read pretty readable query too. So that's nesting, and we're gonna see more of that. And so Malloy operate, Malloy reads non-rectangular data, and it writes non-rectangular data. And this is what that query would look like if you had to write it yourself. Okay, so. Um, but it's nice because it just it, it abstracts it away. It makes a very simple it makes a very simple usage, but but it but it writes queries that you wouldn't necessarily want to try to write yourself. Question? What format would it write that uh, nested? Table into would it write it into a JSON object? It in would. Your table? All all the SQL dialects return nested data in arrays, so it'll be an array of structs that it would return. And if you got that out as JSON from your database, it would come back out as JSON. So it it, it return. So what this is doing is it's produce it's doing an array ag of a struct for you and returning the results. Hey, Lloyd. Hi. Uh, he's asking how efficient it is. It, uh, Basically, what my concern is that you might be throwing too many subqueries uh, to generate the result in the format that you want. Actually, uh, so, and, yeah, yes. let me just answer that for you, because actually these queries are super efficient. They read the data exactly one time. Okay, so uh, the, the first part of the query produces a wide table, and then it's, it's essentially the way that this operates is the first part of the query produces a wide result. And then, it, it, and then it nests the data for you. So all Malloy queries read, uh, basically read data only one time. And, and you always translate to SQL, right? Always. Every, every single Malloy query is translates to one SQL. No. Excuse me? So the data loads in a memory system memory or uh, how where, where it's stored. Okay. So Malloy writes to BigQuery, right? Will write queries against BigQuery, DuckDB, and Postgres today. And Malloy does not store any results. So Malloy always you you have a Malloy model. You write the model. It reads this this it it first reads the schema from the database for the tables that it's interested in. It figures out how to write a query and it presents that query back to the database and returns the results. So it's, it, it, it does, it's, it's, always, it's all entirely SQL-based. SQL is assembly language for Malloy. So you can think of it as a, C, as a C++ compiler for C, or you know, C converts to assembly, Malloy converts to SQL. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause on the questions for a second because okay. I'm gonna go through a demo, and then I think we'll answer. So uh, if you open your laptop, go to that URL, and you're running Malloy and then I will run Malloy too. <laughs> so it's github.dev Malloy data slash patterns. And this is gonna be Malloy running in your web browser. So here we are. Um, in GitHub, 
Uh, I don't know if, you've used, if you know that VS Code runs in GitHub in a weird way, but if you go to, a, if you go to any repo and you're logged into GitHub, um, I have data that's here. I have uh, some data, some parquet files that I put up here. Um, I have, um, and I have some alloy files. If I press dot here, what this does is it loads, um, it, it basically loads VS Code, and then what it, does, what it should ask you, if it doesn't, it should ask you to install, install Malloy. If you don't see that, type Malloy and install this extension. Okay, and once, we, once you've installed it, you, you can now run Malloy in your browser. And it, run, it uses DuckDB WASM that is built into your, that is built in. So this is all running in this browser. This isn't even my machine. I walked in, logged into GitHub, and I'm running this, because my machine wouldn't talk to the screen. So that may other be problems, but let's, <laughs> the demo, let's hopefully the demo gods are good to me today. Um, I can, once, once I've done that, I can go over, and so here's a simple Malloy file, and um, I can run a query by just clicking this run thing and it will run it for me. So here's a simple one, airports table. I've added a couple of measures, airport count, average elevation and percent of all, and I've done a nested query like we looked at earlier, right? So, but I'm gonna show you, we'll start with something more interesting. So this is, Malloy also runs in notebooks. So I have a notebook here. It's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run it, show you the kinds of results that you can generate, and then we're gonna go build it. We're gonna actually turn around and build it by hand and so you can see how it all works. So first, so here is the, here is this, there's a, a um, we're looking at airline flights. This is the data set that I used when I was actually starting Looker. I'm still using the same data set since 2000, whatever. Um, and uh, what I'm looking at here is flights by carrier. And I wanna know for each destination, uh, the number of flights and then the carriers that fly to that destination and uh, all kinds of information about it. So we'll, we'll, the, the, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, but let's take a look at the results. So here is uh, Atlanta. There are 17,000 flights. Delta is the big one that flies here. Look at, the, you can see it over the years. Uh, we can take a look at Delta and see where Delta flies. It looks like 6% of them go to St. Louis and, uh, and uh, uh, 5% go to Huntsville, and Atlantic Southwest flies a lot of flights, and then there's a lot of smaller flights, smaller airlines that fly. And this is repeated, right, for every airline, for every airport. So we can go look at Dallas-Fort Worth, and we can see that it had 17,000 flights, and American, and American Eagle are the big ones, and this is where American flies to Chicago and to Washington, and, and, and so on. And we can then look at Chicago, and... And this is all out of this one data model, one model, and one query, right? Um, we can, oh, um, here's another query, which basically tracks a plane, planes through the sky. So we're looking at um, Southwest Airlines for the first five days of 2002, and we wanna look at all of their planes and see what the routes were for all of the planes. So we're gonna, filter the data first, and then we're gonna group by tail number, which is the plane, and then we're gonna look at it by day, and then within each date, we're gonna look at uh, the, the, the flight routes. And so this, air, airport, this aircraft on this day started in Tampa and went to Austin, and then Austin to LAX, and LAX to Oakland, and Oakland to Burbank, et cetera. And then the next morning from Oakland, it went to, uh, to Burbank and to Burbank to and so we can see this plane flying through the sky and then another plane of Southwest and another plane of Southwest. Okay, and these are, each of these, we just ran two queries, one query for the first one and one query for the second one. Um, okay, does that, does that look cool? Yeah, that's cool, right? <laughs> All right, how does this work? Let's start with a really simple model. We'll go to test.malloy notebook. So, I have, a, so I, have, I have some, some data tables. Um, and in, in Malloy, I have a, a Malloy schema that I can click, and it shows me the structure for each of these tables. So here's the, here are the fields that are in flights, here are the fields that are in carriers. I can preview the flights table by clicking preview, and it will show me that, right? Um, and I can add a cell to write a query against this. So I'm gonna, I mean, it's a notebook, so I'm gonna make a new query, and I'm gonna write query flights aggregate flight count 
is count. All right, cool. How many flights are in this database? All right, there are a third of a million flights. Um, the very first thing I can do is I can build, we talk about sources being reusable, I can take this, and I can build a reusable measure here. Ah, if I could type. Sorry, it's not my laptop. Uh, flight count is that. All right, and then I don't have to say this anymore. And let's group this by carrier in two. Group by carrier. Okay, and because we saw that in flights, there was a carrier here, so we can group by it, and then I can run this, and great. That's pretty terrific, right? Um, well, I really want the carrier's name, so I can make a join. Uh, let's take a look at the carrier's table again. Uh, preview the carrier's table. It looks like code is the thing that we would want to join on. So we can join, join one carriers on carrier equals carriers to code. Great. Um, and then if I go into here, actually go back to here, we notice that the carriers showed up. I can, I can look at the nickname, I can just grab that, and we can replace that with carrier's nickname, and now when we run it, we have our Southwest. Cool, right? So you're starting to build up this reusable model. The query is more readable, the things that I'm doing are more useful. Uh, you know, um, uh, I can, uh, let's take this. We can actually put queries themselves into the model. Query by carrier is and let me indent this all right and i can tag this as by carrier and let's for grins let's add another measure here which is total distance total or actually average distance And let's add that here. Great, all right. So now when I run this by carrier, I can see that like, I've got my average distance and pretty simple. This, this, this query gets to be reused. What's, what's really nice about this is if you're going from an API, all of your query stuff can actually be in the model, in the code. There's an NPM library for this you can use to, like there's, so what's, what's great is that all of the logic stays within, stays within the Malloy model. Um, the other cool thing we can do here is we saw graphs before, and graphs are just a, a kind of a rendering option. So I can style this. And if I run this again, it shows up as a bar chart. Pretty cool, right? Pretty relatively simple, straightforward, easy to use. Like, you know, not. Um, let's let's build another query. Let's let's look at it by month. So time is something we always want. To, is in every, like every, every, it's one of the things you do all the time. So we group by uh, departure month is departure time dot month and aggregate a little aggressive there month and we'll aggregate flight count okay run that uh, this is probably great as a line chart uh, so we can do a style We can run that. Terrific. Let's take this one and put it in our. All right. 
So we can then add another query, query by month is, and we paste that, indent it. And there's another cool trick I can do here, which is that if I actually name this thing with an underbar line chart, I don't have to do the style thing. And if it's nested in something, it'll just do the right thing. So I can do this by month line chart. And if I run that, it's great. It, it, it does the right thing. Okay, so let's build one more query. And I'm gonna um, group by destination, which is what we were looking at before. And we're gonna aggregate flight count. And then we're gonna nest some things. We're gonna nest by carrier, and we're gonna nest by month line chart. Look at that. Is that, see? See? <laughs> and this is all, you, you, can, you could run this all in your browser. Like, there are all examples here. Now I can go in and I, I can nest, I can have net things with nested and nest further things. Um, if we go into patterns, uh, you can see that the quick start for Malloy is all here and can, you can run any of these queries and learn the language. In this patterns thing, you, it, so every one of these queries is just runnable. You can just click it and run. Um, there, are, there are data pipelines. I love this. This is one of my favorites. Okay, who's ever tried to build a histogram in SQL? Right, and what is the problem? Is that the endpoints are always a drag, right? It's like uh, you want to, you got to pin it, you got to bin it by something, but that bin size really depends on your data, right? It's always you're always trying to figure out how to bin it on the data. So, so this query, this simple little query, basically by elevation, bins it, figures out the min and max, and then collects the data, right? And then the next, this is a pipeline statement. This says take the output of the last query and pipe it. So the first stage of the query does this. If we run this. The first stage of the query produces the bin size and then a bunch of data. And the second stage of the query produces, produces bins, 30 bins. Well, let's make it 10 bins and run it and we'll see. Okay, now it, now it, oh, that's wrong, hang on. Now it's 10 bins, right? You can, so th this, this little data model basically makes it so that the, the data auto bins so I'm gonna put it back to 30 here. And, and when we run something, we can look at like this query um, is overall distribution, but this is the distribution in Florida, right? And you'll notice that the, it, it shows you a, a histogram that makes sense for Florida, right? Because it figured out the bin size and produced 30 bins. And then within each of the states, it produces the bin that's appropriate as a nested query for each of these things, because these, because once you've built this query that's into the source, it can be used anywhere, right? And you, if we if we want to run this query, you don't want to write this SQL, you don't, <laughs> but you do want the result. <laughs> okay, that's pretty much where I'm going to. So makes so, so Malloy makes things reusable. It, it's it's that we're um, we're in the process of adding. Our, whole, our goal is that Malloy is Turing complete for data. Everything that you can do in SQL, you can do in Malloy. You can, uh, currently, if we don't do it, you can escape to SQL to, um, to run parts of the language in SQL. So if you need to do a union, we don't do unions yet. You can do that in SQL, for example. Um, uh, window functions are coming in the next month, and, um, and uh, there, there are some percent of... Uh, percent of total calculations that Malloy does that nothing else really does very well and all kinds of really cool goodies that are in the language. So that's, that's it.